Okay, two questions. Let's hope I did this right. There we are. Have you ever read a book or an article, learnt from it, and yet later learnt that you had missed some important features of it? What about if somebody was to write a letter to Eastview and challenge us on things, what would those things be? Those are just two simple questions for us to look at, explore this morning. Let me say them again. If you've ever read a book or an article like me, you've read it, and then quite a while later, it can be even at school you do these things, and you come back and you go, oh, I didn't, I missed that bit, or I missed that. There's something that I didn't, and if somebody was to write a letter to us, I wonder what it would say. Well, as we have been looking at 1 Corinthians over January, I decided to finish with perhaps the most well-known chapter from the book, or as some people may think of it, the wedding chapter. I'm talking about what? Oh, lots of you know. Very, very good. Interestingly, although it is often quoted in weddings, it doesn't mention marriage at all, but it is about relationships, and in particular, love. So, 1 Corinthians 13. I'm just going to read the whole of it. Read the whole of 1 Corinthians 13. If you have your Bibles and you want to um, look at them, it might be in a different translation, might even be in a different language, that's fine. But 1 Corinthians 13. If I could speak all the languages of earth and of angels, but didn't love others, I would only be a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I had the gift of prophecy, and if I understood all of God's secret plans and possessed all knowledge, and if I had such faith that I could move mountains, but didn't love others, I would be nothing. If I gave everything I have to the poor and even sacrificed my body, I could boast about it, but if I didn't love others, I would have gained nothing. Love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful, or proud, or rude. It does not demand its own way. It is not irritable. It keeps no record of being wronged. It does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. Love never gives up, never loses faith, is always hopeful, and endures through every circumstance. Prophecy And speaking in unknown languages and special knowledge will become useless, but love will last forever. Now, our knowledge is partial and incomplete, and even the gift of prophecy reveals only part of the whole picture. But when the time of perfection comes, these partial things will become useless. When I was a child, I spoke and thought and reasoned as a child. But when I grew up, I put away childish things. Now we see things imperfectly, like puzzling reflections in a mirror. But then we will see everything with perfect clarity. All that I know now is partial and incomplete. But then I will know everything completely, just as God knows me completely. Three things will last forever. Faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love. My hope and prayer for this morning is that no matter how many times you have heard or read those words or heard somebody speak on those words, that passage, you will get something new from it. And perhaps together we will be able to answer the second question. Chapter 13 is such a well-known and loved chapter, which is wonderful. But as Gordon Fee um, reminds us, because it is so well-known, this can lead to a few issues. People try to break it down into such tiny little pieces 
that they can miss the beauty of the whole passage. And the other thing is we often read it's so much for today that we miss the context in which Paul was writing it. Let me try and explain. When I said we are going to look at the most well-known passage in 1 Corinthians, and I said 1 Corinthians 13, I think a lot of you would have gone, hmm, and something would have popped into your head, a memory. In particular, one word. That word would be love. For a lot of you, maybe something else. And, and then some of you would be super clever, that you would go, ah, oh, I remember hearing people talk about this, and they talk about the Greek word. And the Greek word is, for love here is agape, and some of you may have even heard somebody talk about the fact that there are many different words for love, particularly um, eros and philia, other words as well. But in this passage, they're talking about agape. And that's true, and that's exciting. You may be able to remember those things. That's clever. But I have a question that I couldn't answer quickly. That's from within 1 Corinthians 13. Who knows, without looking, no looking, no cheating, who knows what chapters 12 and 14 are about? Just put your hand up if you do. Can you remember? Oh, yeah, a few, a couple. That's pretty cool. 12 and 14 are about spiritual gifts in the body and building the body up by using these gifts. Now, why is that important when there seems to be this like little interlude, but where they're talking about love? Well, I think it's really important, but let's explore the context Paul is writing to a little more. I've said this before, some of you will know, Corinth is an important Greek city, and the patron saint of Corinth at the time was Aphrodite, or her Roman name, Venus. Aphrodite was seen as the goddess of love. Yet Paul is presenting in his letter a very different understanding of love for what the society were thinking of. In verse 1, we had the words, If I could speak all the languages of the earth and of angels, but didn't love others, I would only be a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. Other translations have it as a resounding gong. And a more detailed description of it might say something like an echoing bronze. Interesting again, Corinth was famous for a special bronze alloy that they'd use to turn into symbols to worship gods. Paul is presenting something that's promoted in that city in a different way. Just like Aphrodite, the patron saint, patron saint, the goddess, but those often called the patron saint of that sort of thing, the goddess of love, and now we've got these clanging symbols, are things that are common within Corinth, but he presents in a different way. He contrasts what people held on to tightly in a, ne in a negative light when it's compared to love. I wonder what that would be for us here in Auckland. A couple of verses later, we read, Love is patient and kind, Love is not jealous or boastful or proud. Love is not proud, pride. For many in the Corinth church, the Corinthians, 
speaking in tongues, prophecy, having wisdom, all sorts of knowledge, was evident of a great spiritual life, and that puffed them up. And Paul flips it on its head. He says a significant part, he spends, sorry, he spends a significant part of his letter challenging the people on their pride, saying, you think you're so good about this? You think you're great about this? You're following this person, so you think you're so good? What about love? He showed people the folly of their pride and how it is not their wisdom or knowledge they obtain from others, even their spiritual gifts, no matter how important they are, but even them is not as important as the love that they get from God found in Jesus. So I told you it was short, and I'd been going through this really quickly, nearly finished. And I read something, like I said in that first question, I read something that made me go back. And it's this. The Corinthians believed the gifts of the Spirit, speaking in tongues, prophecy, words of knowledge, etc., were evidence of a strong relationship with God. And these gifts would last forever. That's what they believed. Paul challenged them on this. Again, contrasting it with love. And before we go any further, the word love, yes, we talk about agape, but in this section, in this passage, love is clearly referring to love for others, and it is an action, an action found in a behavior towards someone else. It is not for selfish gain. It is not a noisy gong, and it is not, clearly not some goddess. This love, this action may be costly as it was for Christ, and yet this love is the key. However, the Corinthian church, some 2,000 years ago, and Corinth as a city is very different to Auckland. Very, very different. And it's very different to Western Christianity in the year 2024. Not all, not all, but a significant part of, I would say, Western Christianity appears to see spirituality or now as an intellectual exercise. So rather than what Paul was saying to the people then, I think he would be addressing something quite different now. This, in the society we live in, it's an intellectual exercise. It's we need to run the right programs. We need to have the right procedures. We need to be careful and not overly simplistic because when we do all these things, Things will go well. Sounds a little bit like pride. I'm confident Paul would disagree with that as well. Speaking in tongues, prophecy, words of knowledge are good, but they will pass away. Having an intellectual understanding, a theological basis to build on, running programs that have the correct, I don't know, procedures, they're good, but they will clearly pass away. What we need is the love of God, because that won't. We need to grow closer to God and love in a sacrificial way, in service of others. Now, before you beat yourself up and say, I can't love like that, for my love of others isn't as pure as what you've just been talking about, what I read in 1 Corinthians I agree. Mine definitely is. I know I fall short. I think we all fall short of that. We on our own merits can't love like that. 
It is only through Christ in community we can grow into this. We have at present a reflection, a foretaste of what is to come, and it is only a mere taste. Love is not just a motivating factor or a nice idea. It has to be a behavior. And there is no greater example of behavior being love than Christ's life in his, and his action. And I hope we're going to see more of that when we start our new series, which will be Meals of Jesus. For Jesus' action displays love, and he does it not just reference, referencing an idea, he lives it. When, I don't know how old I was, this is showing my age, so I won't say it, there were books brought out, I don't think I read, I might have read one of them, but there were books brought out that you could read and, and then it ask a question. And then, depending on what you, you chose, you could go to a different part of the book. Who remembers those things? Yeah, there's a few of those, you know, whatever those books were. So I have a question for you. And your answer changes the end of the um, message. Seriously. But it's not that big a question. It's just, do you want one story or two? Seriously, I got two stories, and I'll give you one or two. Hands up, one. Good, there's a couple. Hands up, two. Okay, you get two. Okay, here we go. I'll read them quick. This one you probably have heard me say before. Uh, but I love it so much that even if you have heard it, bad luck, you get it again. This, these are two quick stories about an individual um, and... I say love demonstrated in action. They're both from a gentleman called Tony Campolo. So Tony Campolo tells how he disembarked, I'm reading them, I'm going to read it, so it'll make it quicker, disembarked from a plane to discover he was scheduled to speak to a group of women at a World Day of Prayer event. He had forgotten about it. He rushed over to the meeting, held at a large, wealthy church, and arrived exhausted. Not knowing what to say to the women gathered at this conference. Before calling him to speak, the leader of the meeting produced a letter from a missionary in Venezuela. Venezuela, And, and um, Tony Campolo relates the story. She read the lady, read the letter from this missionary who had a hospital and they needed $5,000 desperately to put an extension on the hospital because they couldn't handle all the patients. She turned to me, this is Tony speaking, she turned to me and said, Reverend, would you please lead us in prayer that the Lord would provide for our sister in Venezuela? And I said, no. She was taken back. I stood up and said, I tell you what I'll do. Oh, I haven't got it. Good. <laughs> I pulled out my wallet and I put all the money in my wallet on the table. I had $2.25. <laughs> that was a good day, he said. I slapped it down on the table and said, you are to put all the cash you are carrying on the table. There were about a thousand women at this conference. And he said, we will count all the money up at the end. And then I will ask God to write a check for the difference if we don't have the $5,000. The lady who had asked him to pray took out her wallet and pulled out $110 of unadulterated cash and put it on the table. His words, not mine, were, why didn't I marry someone like that? (laughs) I said, we're on our way. We have $112.25. 
I then pointed to the woman in the front row. See, I'm not pointing to anybody in particular. I then pointed to the woman in the front row and said, you're next. She looked around and, and uh, he, he said, I'm serious. Come up here and put your money on the table. He said, I come from an African-American church, and you know, that's how we take up offerings. Um, so she sheepishly came forward and put her money on it. And I said, okay, let's line up one by one and put our money on the table. We did that, and the money kept piling up. And we had over $7,000 instead of the 5000 that was being required and I know, again, his words, and I know we didn't get it all because I could see some woman giving me a dirty look as they walked by. And I said, the sheer audacity of asking God for $5,000 when God has already provided more than $7,000. Two. One of my favorite stories about intercessory prayer comes from Tony Campolo. A prayer meeting was being held for him just before he spoke at a Pentecostal church. College, sorry. Eight men took Tony into a back room of the chapel, had him kneel, laid their hands on his head, and began to pray. That's a good thing, Tony wrote. Except they prayed for a long time. And the longer they prayed, the more tired they got, and the more tired they got, the more they leaned on his head. <laughs> I want to tell you, when eight guys are leaning on your head, it doesn't feel so good. <laughs> to make matters worse, one of the men was not even praying for Tony. He went on praying for someone named Charlie Stoltzfus. I don't know how to pronounce that name, S-T-O-L-Z-F-U-S, Stoltzfus. Dear Lord, you know Charlie Stoltzfus. He lives in that silver trailer down the road a mile. You know, the trailer, you know the trailer, Lord, just down the road on the right-hand side. Tony said he wanted to inform the prayer that it was not necessary to furnish God with directional material. Lord, Charlie told me this morning he's going to leave his wife and three kids. Step in and do something, God. Bring that family back together. Tony writes that he finally got the Pentecostal preachers off his head, <laughs> delivered his message, and got in his car to drive home. As he drove into Pennsylvania Turnpike, he noticed a hitchhiker. I'll let him tell you the story from here. This is Tony again speaking. We drove a few minutes and I said, Hi, my name's Tony Campolo. What's yours? He said, My name's Charlie Stoltzfus. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. I got off the turnpike at the next exit, headed back and headed back. He got a bit uneasy with that. And after a few minutes, he said, Hey, mister, where are you taking me? I said, I'm taking you home. He narrowed his eyes and asked, why? I said, because you just left your wife and three kids, right? That blew him away. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's, uh, that's right. With shock written all over his face, he plastered himself against the car door and never took his eyes off me. Then I really did him in as I drove right to his silver trailer. When I pulled up, his eyes seemed to bulge as he said, how did you know where I lived? I said, God told me. <laughs> when he opened the trailer door, his wife exclaimed, you're back, you're back. He whispered in her ear, he, oh, sorry, he, you're back, you're back. He whispered in her ear, and the more he talked, the bigger her eyes got. 
Then I said with real authority, again, this is Tony, then I said with real authority, the two of you sit down. I'm gonna talk to you two, and you are gonna listen. Man, did they listen. (laughs) That afternoon, I led those two people to Jesus Christ. Okay, a story of giving $7,000 in the end and leading two people to Christ. Not exactly what you'd take out of that passage. Love is patient, love is kind. Love is an action. That action may be $110 out of your wallet. It may be driving on a different direction and then praying for someone. It may be listening to people when they are praying. The key is love And this love is for others. Love is an action, it's a behavior, and love is demonstrated in community. You know, Corinth had spiritual gifts. Today, we probably have some sort of intellectual Christianity. Whatever it is, love remains. If someone was to write a letter to Eastview, and challenge us on things, what would those things be? I don't want to speak on behalf of you, but there are a number of things, if someone was to write a letter to me, that I could be challenged on. And I wouldn't be surprised if some of those things involve me not loving others. And they may actually be similar things to you as well. Let me pray. Father, thank you so much that you love us. Thank you for the time we've had this morning. Thank you that you demonstrated, not just told us, not just wrote a story, you demonstrated your love for us. Amen.